Hello, I'm Sandy Fredman. I'm Professor of Law here at Oxford University and the Director of the Oxford Human Rights Hub. And I'm Kate O'Regan. I'm a former judge of the South African Constitutional Court and of the Namibian Supreme Court. And I'm the inaugural director at the, of the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights here at Oxford. We're very sorry we can't be with you in Cape Town today, but we thought it might be helpful if we could record a conversation in which we discuss the topic of human rights. You're going to spend the next five days talking about human rights, so we thought we'd start with a very simple question, which is, what is human rights, or what are human rights? Sandy. Yes, well, when I give this class to my students, I normally ask them an, an initial question by putting to them a very contested right, which is the right to paid holidays. And I ask them whether they think that's a human right. Um, I, I show them and you should probably have this before you in your materials, I show them that Article 24 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights actually gives a right to periodic holidays with pay, but contrast that with a modern philosopher of human rights called Griffin, who says as follows, uh, we cannot establish the existence of human rights simply by declaring it to be so, he says, we can get it wrong, and therefore it's very important to discover how we decide what's right or wrong when we're thinking about human rights. For example, he says, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights declares that there is a right to holidays with pay, to which the universal and cheering response is, um, whatever this particular entitlement is, it is certainly not a human right. So the question is, what else do we need for it to be a human right apart from it having been declared, even in the Universal Declaration, even by many countries in the world? Do we need something else? Do we need dignity, for example, rationality as it was in, in older times, autonomy perhaps? Um, Griffin himself talks about normative agency. But perhaps for this discussion we don't really need to get into that because as judges wouldn't you think, Kate, we are really starting from the text itself and it does really matter what the text says rather than what went behind it. Yes, I think, I think that's right. It's not that those questions are irrelevant to the interpretation of text, but for judges the first question is what does the text say? And for many of us we are encountering human rights either in a Bill of Rights attached to a constitution. In Africa that's, that's very common. Or we may be encountering it in a piece of national legislation, such as an Equality Act or a Prohibition of Discrimination Act, or, for that matter, the Criminal Procedure Act. Uh, or we may be encountering it in a piece of um, international, an international agreement, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But we are always looking at text. The, the anterior questions that you're talking about uh, will inform that. And sometimes the text itself gives you guidance on that. But I think that it will be useful to start this week that you're um, commencing with us talking particularly about text. And if one looks at the history of um, human rights texts, uh, arguably the first legally justiciable text is that of the, the United States Constitution, which dates back to the late, late 18th century. Sandy, can you tell us a little bit about the, the US Constitution? Yes, so it wasn't originally agreed in the original Constitution because the drafters of the US Constitution thought it would be enough to have a separation of powers through federalism. But very soon they realized that they did need a Bill of Rights. So after the Constitution had been agreed, they introduced a Bill of Rights by way of ten amendments. Um, but if you look at the ten am amendments, you can see that in some ways they have dated they show their age and in some ways they have been very enduring. In fact, the US Constitution has been said to be very short, very old and very difficult to amend, amend which matters a lot in terms of judicial interpretation. If we look at the, the amendments, there is, they're quite a motley group. Um, the First Amendment t brings in most of the things that we would normally associate with bills of rights. There is freedom of religion, in fact it's called the state shall not um, make any law about establishment of religion. There's freedom of speech and freedom of the press, which we'll come back to discussing later on. There's the freedom of assembly, 
Um, but then the Second Amendment is the right of people to keep and bear arms, which we know has become very contested in modern day America. The third is about no soldier shall in time of peace be courted in any house without the consent of the owner. And then the rest of them are, are largely speaking, our traditional um, rights, such as not to be subject to unreasonable searches and seizures, um, the, the requirement of a jury for both capital crimes and civil claims, and particularly important, the um, right not to be subject to um, cruel and inhuman punishment or torture. But what is glaring about the first ten amendments is that they coexisted with slavery and there was at that, this point actually no prohibition of slavery. And it really took until um, Civil War, which was nearly a century later, before three more amendments were introduced. Um, the Thirteenth Amendment, which abolished slavery in 1865, the Fourteenth Amendment, which was about equality and due process, which we're going to talk about more later, and the Fifteenth Amendment, which is that um, everyone has the right to vote regardless of colour. And it should, we should mention at this point that there was no mention in the Fifteenth Amendment of the right to vote regardless of gender. Mm. And that too had to wait until the Nineteenth Amendment in 1920, which gave the right of, men, of women to vote equally with men. So that was the US Constitution. Um, but really, human rights didn't feature on the world stage, did they, properly, until after the Second World War, did, didn't I they, I think Kate? that's right. I think that the Second World War and the devastation that it wrought right across the globe uh, resulted in a, a widespread feeling that there was a need for an international response uh, to what had happened. And of course it was also at a time of a, of a beginning of a recognition that um, colonialism was a, a system that was wreaking havoc as well. So you, you saw a, a, a growing movement towards the idea of human rights then. The Bogotá Declaration of Human Rights in Latin America in some ways was a precursor of what is the document, of course, that we all see in some ways as the great founding document of, uh, of human rights for our contemporary era, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted by the United Nations in 1948 after a really almost a two-year period of drafting um, in which um, drafters from a wide range of nations, from Lebanon, from China, from France, Eleanor Roosevelt from the United States, were closely involved in preparing the text. And that text is very different to the text of the ten, um, to the, uh, to the ten amendments and all the fourteen amendments you've just discussed in relation to the US Constitution. Um, perhaps most notably because not only does it include civil and political rights, but it also includes economic and social rights. Um, and so this was a very important uh, breakthrough, a recognition in a sense built to some extent on, on uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's assertion of the four great freedoms, uh, which recognize that we should have freedom from want, freedom from fear, as well as freedom to speak and freedom of religion which, in a sense, balanced out civil and political and economic and social rights. So that was a great moment for, for human rights, but of course it was only a declaration and it wasn't binding. Um, and, and with the start of the Cold War following shortly, frankly, upon the adoption of the Universal Declaration, it was quite a long time, wasn't it, Sandy, before um, the original vision, I think, of the drafting committee, which was that it would be followed by two by a binding international agreements uh, was met. In, in fact, you know, really we took to the 1960s and indeed 1970s before that came about. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the, 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 two, the two, as they call them, the International Bill of Rights, the two great covenants? Yes, I think probably what's most striking about them um, is that this unity of rights that you mentioned from the Declaration uh, was not sustained and the architecture of the International Human Rights, the International Bill of Human Rights has been to create two separate covenants, one for civil and political rights which is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, which was adopted in 1966 and a separate one, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights 
which was also adopted uh, around about that time. And um, this really does reflect some of the politics of the Cold War, where it was thought that, um, in a sense, the freedom from fear side of it would, was um, Western capitalist democracies, which were all about freedom of the individual from state control. And those were the ones that were emphasized in the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, whereas the freedom from want side of it was the one that was being endorsed and pushed by the socialist or the communist countries who thought, who at least asserted that more important than freedom from state control was the state uh, addressing people's basic needs. So we landed up with two separate covenants and another thing which is really worth making or taking note of is that whereas the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights gives rise to immediate obligations, the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights takes um, account of the fact that states might differ in their resources they have available and so the rights are generally speaking only required to be realized progressively subject to available resources or to maximum available resources. So those were the, the main international covenants but Kate there was following on from that and also during that time there were quite a lot of quite specific covenants weren't there? Yes. Do, you, do you want to talk a bit about those? Yes well in fact the Universal Declaration was preceded I think by a couple of days, by the Genocide Convention. So in some ways that was the, the first of the, of the um, human rights uh, international agreements. And of course, again, very much responding to the, to the Holocaust, to the, to the aftermath of the Second World War. And shortly after that, the second was really the Refugees Convention, 1951. And of course today, when we're living in a time of uh, a, a, such deep problems of, of refugees, and Im immigration, this convention is of particular importance and it dates back to 1951 and of course reflects a lot of the concerns of that time. Following on those, when there was a gap which was then uh, followed by the, the two covenants you've spoken about and then we had a string of international covenants that came in the, in the 1980s in particular, 1990s. So the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women the Convention on the Elimination of Racial, Dis Racial Discrimination, Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the Disability Convention. So these have been uh, more recent um, additions to international human rights law, very influential, each of them with their own reporting mechanisms and systems of enforcement, and all of them of importance, I think, to judges in national jurisdictions when interpreting the rights in their own constitutions, um, but also in uh, thinking about um, you know, what, rights, what are rights and why do we care about rights. I think this framework of international human rights law is particularly important. But of course in addition to that there is the move to regional conventions. So we saw um, in 1950 the, the European Convention on Human Rights being adopted with, uh, followed by the end of that decade with a, a system of enforcement. Um, the convention on uh, the American Convention on Human Rights, which had had several pre precursors, we've already mentioned the Bogotá Declaration, and of course, then in the 1980s, the the African Charter um, on Human and People's Rights, which has been supplemented by the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child and the 1990 Protocol to the African Charter. So these uh, regional um, uh, agreements. Uh, also very influential sources of, of human rights norms. And there'll be several sessions during your week ahead talking not only about the great international covenants but also about the, the regional covenants. So we're not going to spend a lot more time talking about them now, uh, we just want to flag them as important um, to, to the exercise. Of course, at more or less simultaneously with this progress, we began to see uh, the progress of constitutionalization around the world. Some of this was, was as a result of the end of uh, colonization in the, in the 1960s and 70s, particularly important for Africa. But also in 1990, with the falling of the Berlin Wall and the independence of many states in Eastern Europe, we saw a great trend of constitution making across those states. And these national constitutions, for those of us who are judges in national jurisdiction, are actually very often our first 
port of call. Um, and, and one of the reasons for that is because of the, the fact that they contain within them justiciable bills of rights. Um, so when we're thinking as judges about uh, enforcing human rights, we'll start with our own text. But it's useful to understand that there's a whole family of texts out there that we'll look at. So we should turn now, I think, to talk a little bit about the issues around differences of text. Um, and, and I think Sandy's already flagged that, um, that, that there are all these different texts. We look at the US Constitution and it's very different to what we see in the more modern constitutions. And we thought it might be helpful to take a specific example, which is the First Amendment, which um, Sandy has already talked about and which I hope that you've got a copy in front of you. Um, so, Sandy, things that we should note about the First Amendment? Yes. Um, so, the First Amendment uh, is, is very short. It simply says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. It, it, it simply says that. And although we said earlier on um, judges should start with the text, it's clear from this kind of a constitutional provision that that's not really enough because in all the many diverse situations in which this has to be applied to real life situations that come before courts, courts will need to interpret this and they'll need to decide what is uh, speech, what is the press, what is freedom of speech and what, what kind of laws are acceptable and what are not. We thought it might be quite useful at this point to, to contrast what is, as we said, the First Amendment, which is one of the oldest protections of freedom of speech, with, with one of the newest, which is the Kenyan Constitution, um, which I think, well, hopefully you have in front of you as well, which is Section 33 of the Kenyan Constitution, which says, um, every person has the right to freedom of expression, which includes freedom to seek, receive or impart information or ideas, freedom of artistic creativity, academic freedom, and it also has some areas to which freedom of speech does not extend. So it explicitly says it does not extend to propaganda for war, incitement to violence, advocacy of hatred, and other such things, um, uh, as well as making it clear that in the exercise of the right of freedom of expression, every person shall respect the rights um, and reputation of others. So faced with these two different, very different kinds of texts, um, and yet the animating principle is broadly speaking the same, um, the, the, the judge's task is, is really to interpret it, both in light of the fact that there's broad agreement internationally that there is, should be freedom of expression, but individual contexts of the, the, the particular jurisdiction within which the court is operating. So how do you think, Kate, as a judge, these kind of interpretive issues can be handled? Are there some guiding principles? Um, or are judges in just in an open field at this point? Mm. There's no doubt that it is easier to be a judge under one of these modern constitutional frameworks. I and mean, when you just look at the Kenyan constitution, it tells you something which I think American courts have had to really grapple with, that you know, incitement to violence is not a protected form of speech. And so, of course, the American courts have had to grapple with this idea of protected and non-protected forms of speech, with very little guidance coming from the text. Whereas I think that those of us who are fortunate to have modern constitutions have been able to, to build on the experience of the um, uh, uh, United States, but also of other jurisdictions, and, and carve out areas which are clear to judges that you know, this, is, um, this is something that's not protected. Of course, there's always going to be line drawing. Um, and, and inevitably, we know that as lawyers. This is interpreting any text. You have to do, uh, there will be some small uh, indeterminate area where you have to try and draw a clear line, which is a principled line. Um, so that's one way in which I think these modern texts are very helpful. But the sort of reasoning that underpins the jurisprudence of other courts can be very helpful to helping you with that line drawing exercise. Um, and of course another very important uh, set of uh, 
rules which are in modern constitutions very often are overarching values. So, uh, for example, in the South African constitution there is section 1. There's a similar provision to that in the Kenyan constitution which articulate certain values uh, and tell you that you know, these are values that you use when you're interpreting uh, the content of, of rights. Um, and they don't have that really in the American constitution. It's interesting that they do tend to look at the Declaration of Independence, which has some of those kinds of ideas, the separate text, but the clear values that you find in, the, in modern constitutions uh, are not there. I think that the, uh, another big difference is the fact in the Kenyan constitution between section 34 of the constitution and, and the First Amendment is the clear regulation of the media. And again, I hope that you've got section 34 of the Kenyan constitution in front of you because uh, the American courts have had to just have this and freedom of the media. And actually, if we look at section 34, um, we see that there is much more careful regulation of the media, the rec recognition that the media are in many ways play an important role in ensuring and protecting the right for people to receive ideas and information, which is uh, a, perhaps an important part of freedom of expression, but often one people don't think about because they think about us talking and not the ability to hear other people talking. So I think these, are, these do make it easier for judges, but it, it's never an easy task interpreting rights. In many ways, I think it's the hardest one for constitutional court judges, and it's often not seen to be that hard. But the reason is that you, you have to explain why it is what you think the core of the right is and why it is that. And we can feel quite uncertain and shaky about this. But if we don't set out our reasons, then I think we're not doing the task of judges and we don't make it easier for, um, for people who are following us to really understand why it was that we think this is important. So I think it, although it's difficult to do and it feels hard when you're writing, I think it is something that really one has to, to engage with. Of course, another big difference between the US Constitution and the Kenyan Constitution is the limitations clause. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about the different types of limitations clauses and what they mean for the interpretation of rights? Yes, yeah, so as you said, it's, it's one of the key difficult task for the judge is to interpret the right. But probably equally and even more challenging is for a judge to determine what are appropriate limits of the right. And many of the cases that come before courts will be reasonably clear that someone is exercising their freedom of speech. But the real issue will be, has the state got a good enough reason to limit that freedom of speech? And how does a court determine when um, a state is justified in, in intruding on these freedoms. Now again, as you said, the First Amendment to the American Constitution is, is actually very unhelpful on this. It's often said to be an absolute right. There is no express limitation in the First Amendment um, stating the circumstances in which a court could find freedom of speech appropriately limited. So the impression seems to be that freedom of speech should be unlimited. And the only way that courts in the US have been able to deal with that is by interpreting speech very narrowly or interpreting some kinds of expression, which we might think of as expression, as not protected speech, mm. so that um, they can bring in the kind of limitations which we see expressly in the Kenyan constitution, such as incitement to violence, which the US courts call fighting words. Um, and the, there have been many cases in the US about obscenity, about pornography. Um, and it's much, much more difficult to work out justifiable limits if you have to pack them into the interpretation of the right itself. But it does show that the, the nature of the limitation, the way the limitation is set up, can affect the substance of the right. Um, the Kenyan constitution, um, like several other constitutions, including the South African and the Canadian, has got a separate clause, a limitation clause, which generally speaking in, in many constitutions, and you will have both the Kenyan and the South African one in front of you, um, work around proportionality. 
The important point is that because it is a fundamental right, the state has the burden of proving, has a, a heavy burden of proving that it's justified in limiting the right and that there are usually some criteria for limitation which are set up. And then the difficult part comes in the balancing, which is very often um, expressed in terms of proportionality. So what has to be shown is that given the in extremely important nature of the right, the fundamentality of it, the um, state is has got a good enough reason, which cannot be achieved in any other way with less infringement on the right, to infringe on the right. Um, what, what's interesting, don't you think, is also the difference between the constitutions which have a separate limitation clause, such as the Section 24 of the Kenyan Constitution, Section 36 of the South African Constitution, and um, bills of rights which may have what we might call internal limitations, for example, the European Convention on Human Rights. So Article 10 of the European Convention, Article 10.1 sets out the freedom, freedom of expression. Article 10.2 says what the, the potential uh, grounds for limitation of the right are for speech. And then that limitation differs as between speech and the other rights, such as uh, assembly, privacy, etc. And how do you think, do you think that matters or do you think that's just a drafting... Um, I, I have worked um, with um, a limitations clause in Namibia, which is different to the general limitations clause. So perhaps I would just say one or two more things about general limitations clauses. I think that um, this idea of proportionality that you've outlined is an important one. And what I think is important about it for judges is that you have to work on both sides of the proportionality. So it's not only saying this is an important right, but it's looking at the nature of the limitation of the right. Because one of the things we recognize about most rights is that they may cover a whole range of activity, take speech, but some of them will be much more core. So the idea that um, somebody may not publish political comment in a newspaper would be right at the heart of the, of the purpose for which we protect speech. And a limitation would therefore be, require much more persuasive justification than a more marginal or less intense limitation. So that when you're working with proportionality, it's not only looking at what government says, but it's looking at what government says in the light of the nature of the specific infringement of the right before you. And general limitations clause allow you to do that very well. In fact, quite often commentators and academics will say that in fact bills of rights nowadays are all about proportionality, but I don't think they are. They're very much about what is the content of the right, why do we uh, protect the right, and what is the nature of this infringement? And then is the government reason a good one? And that's, I think, an appropriate uh, approach to dealing with general limitations. But when you're dealing with specific limitations, and many of them are modeled on the European Convention, as you say, which doesn't talk about, a, a, it, it identifies particular reasons for which um, governments can limit rights. So national security is, is one of them. The health and good morals of the people is another. These themselves as concepts are quite tricky. And it, it doesn't mean that a good reason... So government's first task is to show that the reason it's limiting the right falls within this specific internal limitation that's been mentioned. And that's the case in Namibia. So it's not, it can't be any reason, and then you weigh whether that's important or not. It's got to get over the hurdle of being within these specified reasons in the Constitution. Um, and I think that that can quite often um, mean that there are, affect the way you interpret the right and affect the way the proportionality exercise works in a way that is, is, is not, I think, as easy to work with, which is one of the reasons why I think that constitutions adopted particularly after the Canadian Charter in the, in the early 1980s, have often opted for this general limitations clause, and both South Africa and Kenya would fall within that. There's another type of internal limitation which I think it's important to talk about, though, and that's a little bit 
like we looked a moment ago at Section 33 of the Kenyan Constitution saying the right of freedom of expression does not extend, extend to incitement of violence. And so although some people might say that's an internal limitation, it's not really a limitation. It's definitional of the right. Okay. And I think when you're interpreting a text and you see something which suggests that the right uh, doesn't extend to a particular, in a particular manner, like incitement to violence, the question you have to ask yourself, is this definitional? Is this about what is in the right? Or is this about what the right may be limited by? And very often it's quite clear. I think Section 33 of the Kenyan Constitution is a very clear example of definitional uh, exclusions in the content of the right. It can be a little bit more difficult when we turn to equality clauses. Mm -hmm. And the classic example there is Section 9 of the South African Constitution, which talks about unfair discrimination. It prohibits unfair discrimination. And because this idea of unfairness echoes with ideas of proportionality. There is, I think, a tendency to see this as an internal proportionality test and not so much a question of an internal definition of what mm -hmm. equality is or is not. So you'll find that, that the more normative the, this internal qualifier, the tendency to see it as a limitation rather than its definition uh, does arise. Yes, yeah, so, so, so now that you mentioned Section 9, perhaps we should go back to another piece of, of text, a precursor of the Equality Clause, and back to the US Constitution, which, as we, which, as we said before, the 14th Amendment was possibly the earliest equality guarantee, and yet had, it's packed full of lots of different things, but is, is extremely challenging. Um, so you should have it in front of you, but just to remind you of what it says, the 14th Amendment, as well as saying that everyone who's born or naturalized in the US should be a citizen, it also goes on to say, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So if we're thinking about definitional issues, um, courts in the US have had to decide what does due process of law mean, what does equal protection of the laws mean, and the question of equality, which is in ubiquitous in constitutions and bills of rights, has been one of the big challenges that courts have had in terms of interpretation. So that raises the question of if you have an open textured vision like equality, uh, where does a judge look in order to uh, give it content, in order to, to define it? And the, the natural thing for judges to do is to look for parliamentary intent. That's where judges get their legitimacy from. It's not from judges' own opinion as to what it's meant, but according to a, a perhaps simplified view of separation of powers, judges interpret what Parliament intended. This is tricky even in a legislative interpretation, as I'm sure you'd agree. But when it comes to constitutional interpretation, it's particularly tricky yeah. because, of course, the Constitution in, in many cases was agreed a long time ago. And even if, as in the Kenyan one, it was agreed reasonably re recently, in due course, the, the time of agreement is, is going to recede into the distance. So one what we get from judges is the need, or what judges need to do, is develop some kind of philosophy of interpretation or interpretation, interpretive theory. Coming from the idea of um, parliamentary intent has developed a notion of what we might call original intent. What did the drafters originally mean? And from what we've seen of the history of the US Constitution, what the drafters originally meant for equality is quite problematic. They didn't necessarily at that time mean equality uh, regardless of colour or race. Even after the 14th Amendment, which was after the abolition of slavery, we get um, the, co the, the drafters of the Constitution were not necessarily convinced that there should be absolute equality between the races. 
So original intent could be problematic because those original drafters may not um, still reflect the modern view. Um, they may not be democratic. Why should current popula populations agree with those who were the drafters many, many generations back, or even one generation back? So original intent may be difficult to discover. Maybe but perhaps these before you go on about that, we should mention how you know, intensely fought this has been in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, this has become one of the huge issues about who is going to be the ninth judge of the U.S. Supreme Court. There has been this sense that, um, that original intent is obviously the way to interpret the Constitution, and it does seem intuitively attractive to judges. But actually, it, 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 it is flawed in the sense that, firstly, we don't know really in the United States what those uh, people who gathered in Philadelphia to adopt the Constitution meant. Um, so it's, it's not easy to do that. And I think what we need to be able to do is develop a different way of thinking about what a constitutional text is, which nevertheless re retains... A, a, a respect for the project of constitutionalism and it isn't just what a judge feels ought to be right but which is uh, more sustainable in the long term and of course the Canadians have had a response to this haven't they? Yes, um, so as you say it's been very fraught in the US and Justice Scalia has, who recently died was the chief proponent of that um, and he was the one who said that it was only original intent who could insulate judges from the temptation to mistake their own predilections for the law. On the other hand, um, the Canadians, when they agreed their charter, even though it's a relatively modern charter, very quickly came to the view that it was impossible to discover what the drafters meant. Not only that, but the drafters uh, should not be the final authority, but the current court should be on what the meaning was. So the Canadians began to develop a notion of what they call living tree. And the importance of living tree is that it is responsive to the current context, but it does have its roots in history. So I really like the tree metaphor. There are lots of other metaphors that have been used. There have been living constitutionalism, there have been um, the European Court has a different way of talking about it, but the tree idea has been elaborated in Canadian courts quite as, as a metaphor for the idea that you don't lose your roots in the text or the roots in the history, but nevertheless a constitution is able to grow with its times and be responsive to the times. And of course it's interesting that the South African Constitutional Court chose a tree as its symbol um, because it has this very much, but both the idea that this represents the document but also that a tree protects and shades and underneath in the South African Constitution there are the people standing underneath the tree. So there's, a, there's an interesting connection there between the two. And I think the Kenyan Constitution, if I'm correct, has a clause in it which says the Constitution continues to speak right. or it is continually speaking. So it almost invites or mandates courts to see itself as developing the meaning. Right. But that leaves us with the, the question of where do, how, where do judges get their compass from? Is there still a risk, as Scalia would say, that judges are just bringing in their own personal beliefs, politics, uh, illegitimately? And, and how do you think courts can protect against that? Well, that's obviously a big question, but the which we can't answer completely today. But, but I think the first thing to do is to recognize that it's important for judges to give their reasons. Mm -hmm. Because you, if you explain why it is that you think a, a right means something, it is, becomes a falsifiable proposition. It allows other lawyers and other judges to engage with your reasoning. If you work just in the language of assertion, then it's much more difficult to engage. So I think the first lesson is give your reasons. The second is, as we've talked about it, context is important. A constitution is for a particular country. And in South Africa, of course, our history of apartheid, colonialism, exclusion, racism are really important factors in the interpretation of the constitution. And every nation will have its own particular issues that inform the interpretation of it. The last thing I want to say, which uh, we haven't really had full time to talk about, however, 
is the whole question of the proper role of courts in a modern democracy because we've talked about the difficulty of interpreting text but it's also important for judges to have a grasp of the fact that in a democracy most of the policy decisions of the day need to be taken by the politically accountable branches of government. So when one's interpreting a text, one needs to always think about ensuring that uh, constitutionalism does not close down politics, but preserves the proper space for political contestation. And this is something I think, it's really a separation of powers question, but something on which you will probably spend quite a lot of time discussing in the next week. It's certainly something that we discussed endlessly at the South African Constitutional Court and upon which we can reasonably disagree, but that it is central to the task of constitutional interpretation, there's no doubt. <clears throat> which is always the spectre of the Lochner and New York case, which I'm sure everybody's very familiar with, which is when, the um, after the Great Depression, the US government tried to bring in a lot of social legislation in order to get the economy going, and the courts were very resistant to that. And the particular case we have in mind is the case in which um, an employer, a baker, challenged working time regulation. It cha the, baker, the employer challenged the fact that the state had um, limited the number of hours that it could employ its employees. Um, what the court said is that that goes against the basic freedom of contract. There should be freedom for the employer to employ its workers for 80 hours a week, 100 hours a week, whatever, because workers and employers were free to agree. So the specter for all modern courts is that courts will cut across what are more policies which are more appropriate for legislatures uh, in, in the name of one kind of understanding of human rights, which really brings us back to the beginning of our question of what is a human right and um, where, what role justiciable human rights play within the modern state. Um, so we've seen that human rights do play an important role, but that they present many challenges in, in their interpretation, in their context, in the role of the judiciary against the legislature, and we're sure that this will be some very interesting material for you in the rest of the week. And we hope that the, this has given you food for thought, which you can continue to develop throughout the rest of your course. So we're sorry Thanks. not to be with you and hope, wish you all the very best for the rest of the week. Absolutely. All, all the best to all of you. Thank you very much.